So obviously I don't have the 13 inch MacBook Pro. This is a Charles 15 inch MacBook Pro. So I have the browser in front of me. I'm looking at the specs of the new 13 inch MacBook Pro. Why is it 13 inches still? I thought we were expecting a 14 inch one. Apple has its reasons. You know, they've got their uh, track of stuff down the line of what they're intending to release with time. I firmly believe they've got the next five iPhones planned, including the one that doesn't have the notch. I'm pretty sure they've got all of this worked out. After Steve Jobs passed away, they had to really slow down and go, okay, what do we have? We gotta make this thing work for the foreseeable future. But I mean, Apple's still going hella strong for not having Steve Jobs there anymore. Anyway, let's go over this, starting at 1299. They always get you with that number. They always make it sound enticing with that small, small, itty bitty number, 1299. Oh, it's, it's not that bad. It's really $1,300 before you add anything usable to it. It uses 10th generation processors with up to 80% faster graphics performance. That sounds really cool until you get it and then you start using it and you're like, oh, it feels just like the last one. <laughs> I'm a little bitter because I've been editing Adobe Premiere on my MacBook Pro 16 inch. Man, it has been the worst editing experience ever. Ever. I think that in Apple's defense is more to do with Adobe than it has to do with Apple. It's just frustrating. Truth be told, uh, using my I iMac Pro, I'm experiencing similar issues now there as well. Adobe just sucks. There was this whole kerfuffle with Adobe where you can't use the older generations anymore. So if you are an Adobe user, and you have the older generations on your computer, never, ever, ever, ever delete it. I'm just putting that out there. Um, although, legally speaking, I didn't say that. that that's just a joke. Uh, up to 10th generation processor with 80% faster graphics, up to 32 gigabytes of memory. That's pretty cool. Stunning retina display with true tone technology, magic keyboard, touch bar. So the thing that I look for right away whenever they release a new 13 inch MacBook Pro is are they able to finally integrate discrete graphics? And they weren't. And then I went over to the PC side because I don't know much about the Surface laptops. I decided to investigate if on the Surface side they do discrete graphics. And from what I could tell, there was no discrete graphics on the Surface laptops either. However, I feel like I recall seeing graphics on the Surface, um, what's it called? The one that's like a laptop uh, the, uh, and an iPad in one. I forgot what those are called. Surface, the Surface Book 2. NVIDIA GeForce GTX discrete graphics. like. I don't know why they're able to put discrete graphics into the Surface Book, but not into the laptops. And I, I mean, that has something to do with space, I guess. And from what I understand, this laptop is a little bit thicker to account for breathing room so that it can cool better. Four core Intel processor up to 4.5 gigahertz turbo boost, which I feel like we all sort of expect that to not happen ever, where you're really gonna get numbers way below that because it's gonna throttle itself so it doesn't melt up to 32 gigabytes of memory. I think that's pretty cool that you can get 32 gigabytes of memory in there. Like the Surface Book, I was just looking at you, the max you can get is 16 gigabytes, although that's a completely different hardware design. It's still neat that you can get 32 gigabytes of RAM. Up to three gigabytes SSD read speeds, that's incredible. I mean, in my opinion, that's incredible. I feel like my iMac standard gets around 2700 read write speed. What I have going on right now is those Samsung T5 drives. I have them uh, married together in a RAID and that gets me about somewhere in the vicinity of 3000 write 4500 read if I'm not mistaken. So this is pretty good numbers. I am actually impressed with that. I don't know what the last generation was to be fair. Photography, coding, video editing, audio, gaming. Who the hell would be gaming on this? I mean, I guess you could, I guess you could. I suppose the integrated graphics are strong enough now that you could theoretically game on this, but I personally wouldn't and I am a Mac head. I am a Mac fanboy and I would never game on a Mac. The last time I gamed on a Mac was when I had an old iMac and somehow StarCraft was compatible with that particular iMac and it ran smooth and I was like cool. But ever since I built my own Hackintosh and I discovered Windows gaming again, I, I never looked back. There's no reason to game on a Mac in my opinion, but maybe I'm being ignorant. Editing multiple channels of video and audio in Final Cut Pro X and experience smoother than ever playback. I believe this, I fully believe this because Final Cut Pro is optimized. You don't even need to necessarily go out and buy the you know huge Mac Pro and spend tens of thousands of dollars because Final Cut Pro is so well optimized and, and from my understanding, I don't use it, but from my understanding, based on all the tech videos I watch, it's so well optimized. In theory, you should be able to get smooth editing and playback even on a 13 inch MacBook Pro. I remember hearing about Louis CK, nothing bad I'm about to say, don't worry. He was editing his show on a 13 inch MacBook Pro years ago. Magic keyboard, powerful arrangement. Gone are the days of the old 
flimsy, broken keyboard. Now, that being said, I personally have never had an issue with the other keyboard, the keyboard that shall not be named. I didn't like that keyboard. I personally hated it, but it didn't ever break on me. That being said, I had refused to buy the MacBook Air that had come out with that keyboard because I was like, I, I just don't want it. I don't want that keyboard. I hate it, I hate it. I don't know why Apple did it. Finally, Apple caved with the 16 inch MacBook Pro and brought back the old keyboard for the most part. And I'm much happier with it. I'm glad that Apple listened to its fan base. I'm glad that Apple listened to its users and brought back this keyboard. This whole nomenclature with like magic keyboard, I find it a little bit insulting, but hey, you know, you gotta sell it. So the fact that Apple has done this at all is nice, but they gotta spin it their way so that, you know, they don't lose face. The touch bar is something I have mixed feelings about. I personally kind of hate the touch bar. There are instances far and few between where it's come handy, but for the most part, I just kind of hate it. It's always just like, oh, I wish I had the old buttons. I just, I, I don't, I don't know why Apple's trying to be cute. It's like we asked for a touch screen and they gave us a touch bar. And the reason they won't give us a touch screen is because it'll undercut their iPad sales and their MacBook Pro sales that, that don't have the touch screen. So instead of just giving it both in one, it's this. And it, it just, to me, this is just annoying. Like, don't, just don't, don't do it at all. What do you, why? This one I'd love to hear from you guys about. This thing with the huge, the ginormous trackpad, it, it's just like, is that, is that wholly necessary, this this big ass trackpad? Like, I, I kind of hate it. I miss the older trackpad. It was adequate for my needs. Cause what now I find when I'm typing, I'm accidentally touching and stuff's just like, maybe I'm doing something wrong or I haven't enabled a certain feature inside the laptop and I was just too lazy to look for it. But I find that the big trackpad is just, is more obnoxious than anything. And I prefer the smaller trackpad, which is why I'm still sticking to my old MacBook Air instead of upgrading to the new one. 25% more color than sRGB, 500 nits brightness, true tone technology. I don't ever use that, by the way. I, I turn that off right away. Wide stereo sound. I, I gotta give credit to Apple in general because they, they managed to produce really nice speakers every time. I've never had a complaint with Apple speakers. Well, particularly with the laptops, the iMacs. The most powerful and versatile port ever. Jonathan Morrison did a video with Phil Schiller and he straight up asked him, are you going to bring back the uh, SD card port? Phil Schiller said, no. <laughs> Jonathan Morrison didn't press him and I was really hoping Jonathan Morrison was gonna press him. There are people who would love to have an SD card back there. It'd be so nice. I don't see why you can't. The most versatile and powerful port ever. Extend your desktop with iPad. I personally don't strongly recommend this. I invested in an iPad for this very thing. It hasn't been the best of experiences. Now, if you're an artist, I think that there is benefits to doing this. I basically bought an iPad so that on the go, wherever I am, I can have a second screen while editing Adobe Premiere. What would have been cooler is if I could just plug my iPad straight into my laptop. But for whatever reason, Apple has yet to integrate this and they insist on this wireless situation, which just introduces more problems in my opinion. And it would just be a lot simpler if you could just plug it in. You could get the data transfer that way, just like a display. And you can power the, the iPad at the same time. It just seems to make more sense to me rather than trying to be cute and make it wireless. There is a, uh, a screen that Lou from Unbox Therapy talked about that I did think about investing in. It's about 500 bucks. Let me see if I can find it real quick for you guys. This one the portable monitor 4K 17.3 inch UHD FreeSync HDR IPS 100% Adobe RGB 4K. Instead of getting an iPad, if you were thinking about doing what I did, which is having a second monitor for video editing anywhere, this is what I would get instead of an iPad. While an iPad also is an iPad, which is really cool, if you just need a monitor and that's your sole need, in getting an iPad to you know have some kind of an extension, this is great. It's a lightweight monitor, it's 4K, you can plug it right in. See right away, $12.99 goes to $19.99. Which one do you think you're gonna get? Are you really gonna settle for one of these three? Maybe there's a lot of you guys who would settle for the cheaper line, for the cheaper end. I personally have a hard time settling for the cheaper one. I'm like, well, I know what's gonna happen. These things are gonna get outdated more quickly if I buy the cheaper one. So I might as well invest in the more expensive one. So you get up to four terabytes SSD. I think that's dope. They're touting that you can have one 6K display. That's pretty cool. That's amazing. So now you can use this display with your new MacBook Pro. 
that's pretty cool. So if we buy it, what does the pricing end up looking like? Let's go all the way to the maximum one. What's the most expensive one cost? I typically end up going with the most expensive processor. Now I don't know. I, I mean, this is not my computer, this is a charge, but I have a 16 inch MacBook Pro and I went for the top of the line everything, which I kind of regret because as a lot of tech reviewers have pointed out, your computer throttles and can't really use all that. So should you spend the extra $200 on the extra processor? It's just 200 bucks when you're already $2,000 in, or in this case, you know, $3,400 in. It's just $200, but really you don't need to spend that. What are you actually getting? You're getting an extra 0.3 gigahertz is what it looks like. Mind. Yeah, I did my math right. I don't think anyone's gonna really notice the difference between these two. The numbers are so close together, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that can actually see the difference between those speeds. What I don't know here is if there is hyper threading on the Intel Core i5. I know i7s generally do. As far as I know from what I last checked, if I'm not mistaken, the i5s also hyper thread. So really you don't need to spend the extra money here. So let's say you're someone who just wants a computer that's a little bit more powerful than the MacBook Air and you want to just surf the web. I personally would just get the MacBook Air if, if that's you. But if you really, really would rather have a MacBook Pro, because you can get more powerful specs, then you just get 16 gigabytes of RAM and a terabyte SSD and you're straight. I don't even know if you need this one, if that's all you're trying to do. Like if you're trying to do anything pro, I don't know why you would do anything less than like max everything. Like, do you really want to carry around a separate hard drive or do you want to have to wait for your shit to download from the cloud or from Dropbox? You might as well just max out your storage as much as you can afford. So let's say we went with the cheapest of 1.4 gig. I really don't see the difference between this and a MacBook Air at that point. Even if you're just writing and surfing the web, I would go with a 1.7 gigahertz. I would still go with 16 gigs of RAM. I'll go with 256 start, uh, there, there you go. $1,700. If all you're trying to do is basically have a, a more beefy MacBook Air, that's $1,700. How much is a MacBook Air at this point? I don't even know. Starting base of $1,300, 1.2, 16 gigs, like I said. They start you off at 512 gigabytes. Around 16, it's about the same price. It's all pretty close together. You're getting a faster, more powerful processor here. If you're doing a lot of Google Chroming, then uh, you might be better off with the MacBook Pro because it's got probably better cooling ins inside of it. Let's say you started off at the $1,500 one, what do you get? This is the eighth gen processors, which according to Dave2D is actually pretty close. It's, it's actually still respectable speeds compared to the 10th gen processors. So unless you go with the newer processor, you can't get 32 gigabytes of RAM. Let's say that you really wanted the newer processor. Your minimum buy-in is $1,800. You can go two gigahertz, 32 gigabytes, 512 gigabytes of, yeah, there you go. That's your minimum buy-in if you wanted maximum RAM storage. Me personally, even if I was buying this just for reading and writing, I would go overkill and I would get the 32 gigabytes of RAM because for whatever reason, memory just gets eaten up more and more with time. Like, especially when you're using stuff like Google Chrome, I am one of those guys that has like 18,000 tabs open. I personally would go with the 32 gigabytes of memory, even though that's way overkill and any other tech person would tell you that. But to me, it just gives you way more overhead in case you wanna do anything fancy with your computer at some point. Your minimum processor speed is still strong comparatively. It's not that far down from the maximum one. If you can even leverage that, that speed that for the extra $200. Get the maximum memory possible. The storage is something you can deal with later if you, if you need to. Let's say you can't afford the extra storage right now. You can still get external drives later on. You can't get external RAM. RAM is RAM, like it's done. <laughs> Whatever you get for RAM is it. So my recommendation for you guys who are like looking to make this as cheap as possible but you want the later generation stuff, I would say go with 32 gigabytes of memory, but most of you will still probably be good with 16 gigabytes of memory. So if you're gonna get 16 gigabytes of memory, I wouldn't get the 10th gen processor unless you really need it for some reason. I think personally, this is pretty cool. I still don't understand why they can't put in uh, uh, discrete graphics in these things when they were able to put discrete graphics into the Surface Book. It just doesn't make sense to me, but I'm not an engineer. I'm sure there's some kind of hurdle that they can't overcome for some reason. We still haven't seen a Surface Book 3, which is I was waiting for. I was actually intent on buying a Surface Book once they released its third generation and it's yet to be seen. There's gotta be some kind of engineering limitation that is causing heating issues. Or maybe there's just not enough room in a 13 inch chassis. Which is why we were all expecting a 14 inch chassis or part of why. That's next year. They still want your money though. They gotta give you something for now. You're holding on to your 13 inch MacBook Pro from 2010. You, they need to give you something to buy now and then regret buying 
next year when they released the 14 inch MacBook Pro. So I'm a little bitter, but I'm still a Mac fanboy at the end of the day. So there you have it. How do you feel about the MacBook Pro 13 inch? Are you gonna buy one? How are you gonna spec it out? That's the thing I really wanna know from those of you who are gonna buy a MacBook Pro 13 inch, the new one. How are you gonna spec it out? And how do you feel about the fact that they still don't have discrete graphics in it? Is it impossible? Are there any engineers who maybe watch this video that can tell me why they can't integrate uh, discrete graphics? So that's it for now. Thanks y'all, I'm Jabby Kuei. Peace out.